get into ongoing debate. Are there any questions out there as to what has been uh, provided? Questions from council. Oh, questions from council. Yeah, okay, sorry. Going the wrong way. Um, questions from council? Yes, Mr. Cooper. Um, Jamie, um, I just have a few uh, questions about this. You described this as an island that's out in front here. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a small island out in front. Uh, I.e. a shoal. Um, I just make that note in that there's a sort of a Google map that shows, um, in fact, from an aerial view, I think it even actually shows where the high water mark is. And so it's, it's very low lying and, and so relatively small in terms of its uh, uh, ability to certainly break up any heavy seas. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask if that was a shoal or an island. Secondly, um, uh, and, and I guess you could agree that it's probably just as much a shoal as an island. Is that correct? It's pretty minor. Yeah. Um, did you and your part of your examination take a look at, because I did, I went to Google Maps and measured distances uh, from this waterfront to the various shores where the winds would whip in. Did you do any measurements like that in your uh, examinations? Um, again, we haven't provided a recommendation on this. We did look at, um, there is quite a distance um, where wave buildup could be fairly significant in this area. Um, I think that's evident from the shoreline and the nature that there's not a lot of vegetation along the shore. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't provided or conducted a detailed analysis as of yet. That would certainly be some, a consideration. Uh, what we've really focused on at this point is providing the, the, the applicable official plan policies for consideration and overview of the application. We anticipated there may be some public comments associated with this, and we want an opportunity to hear those before we got into some detailed analysis of the proposal. As we did expect, there may be some modifications proposed by the proponent subject to the comments of neighbors and those So just a, a, a couple of more questions. And in terms of the distance, I, I'm reading this report and I just want to understand, does, is this report saying that it's 26 meters from this shoreline to this shoal? Is that what it's saying? I'm sort of, it says the applicant proposes to locate a boat port in an area where the shore to shore width is approximately 26 meters. Uh, I'll have to confirm that for you after the meeting. Okay, so I, I'm just asking that, and if it, it is 26 meters, and this, this proposal is going to take up a good deal of that space, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And, and uh, so I just want to understand that. And then finally, just looking at the uh, Google Maps and so forth, I wanted to understand the water depth between this shoreline and the shoal. Uh, have you examined that in terms of the reason I ask the question is, and typically uh, in areas where there's a lot of local traffic, often people use inland um, waterways, and this would be one of them, where they would sort of skirt along the shoreline if there was enough water there. It appears that there is, certainly from, from looking at it from the air. I wondered if you'd looked into that, because that'd be another consideration that I would suggest is uh, pretty significant. If boats have used this on a regular basis, and I'm not talking about cabin cruisers that are coming from Port 7, but rather the local boat traffic, if that's being used, and especially if, if it's uh, after dark, uh, this could be a really serious navigation problem. So I, I'd, I'd ask you to maybe take a look at that, and if you don't have an answer to that question. Yeah, as I mentioned, we haven't done some detailed analysis about this yet. We are wanting to have the public meeting, get some feedback, but that's definitely something that we'll look into. Thank you. Councillor Kay, you had your hand Yeah, up. I had my hand up because I wanted clarification of something that Peter had asked um, as far as the distance from the shore to the shoal. Um, because there's discrepancies, one I calculated out it's about four meters, another one I think the planner, planner says it's 14 meters. So I think it's something that we definitely need to know because it makes a big difference. Any others? I, I have a question. Uh, did anybody contact the federal government? I mean, this could be navigable water. Um, and I would just 
also comment that from the experience back in 2013, I believe that somebody could have a dock going out a total of 86 feet, so they could actually tie right into that if it's uh, if it's uh, less than uh, whatever that is, 28, 28 meters. Um, so uh, with that, and I assume the answer is nobody has had any contact with the federal government. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I'll put questions out to the to the applicant and then to the rest of the public. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of council, staff, uh, the public. My name is Kevin Crozier, uh, Crozier Designs, Inc. Uh, I am the architectural designer for both the cottage and for uh, information relating to this application. Uh, I had sent in a PowerPoint uh, slide because I think there's actually a fair bit of maybe miscommunication relating to this application. So I just wanted to clarify a few things. And I guess my understanding is that's my role this morning is information uh, so that we can uh, get a clear idea of what we're proposing. Uh, also, just to let you know, uh, prior to today's date, we only received uh, three letters of comment relating to, to neighbors' uh, concerns relating to this project. I understand there's a fourth. Um, my client has had some opportunity to talk to his neighbors, but being new to the area, although not new to Georgian Bay, uh, he's been voting in Georgian Bay for 25 years has been uh, a cottage owner in the Cognachine area for over 10, and so is not new to Georgian Bay. Um, so I'll just go through this, and then uh, I just want to have a quick comment at the end uh, relating to our application, and I guess some, some hope for more uh, discussion relating to concerns addressed by uh, the, uh, the neighbors, and perhaps some clarification uh, from staff as well. So without further ado. Uh, these are pictures that uh, we've taken at two different times of the year. Obviously, we've looked at uh, some photos that are, were taken recently. So this is the gap or the small uh, interior uh, space, uh, narrow water body between the island and the shoreline at 240 Moore Point Road. The second one to the right on the top is taken from the top of uh, the uh, incline that goes down to the water which also illustrates that, that distance. And I want to talk about that distance later because I know there was some, some questions relating to that. And then these are two winter photos, uh, not exactly from the same locations as the one. Well, the one uh, to the left is actually fairly similar, uh, winter to summer. Gives you a sense of, of what's there and the protection uh, that that island or shoal uh, produces against that shoreline. And then the other one just looks uh, more uh, towards the, uh, the west or northwest along the shoreline. Oops. So this is the uh, proposal as it's been put in uh, for this zoning amendment application. Uh, it shows a U-shaped boat port. And that's something else I just wanted to be clarified because there's a lot of back and forth about boat house, boat port. This is not an application for a boat house. It is for a boat port. Uh, it is also for a floating dock, uh, not a fixed dock. Uh, so no part of the, the dock other than the, the uh, bridge uh, or ramp that connects the shoreline to the boat port dock uh, would be uh, attached to the, the lake bed. And in both of these situations, uh, the, we have accurate survey information relating to the property. The shoal or island, the NS1 island uh, or shoal, uh, was not part of that survey because my uh, client does not own that. Uh, however, uh, I took information from uh, the township's GIS mapping system and applied it to our survey. And so hopefully it's fairly accurate in terms of where it's located and the size of, the, of this island. So again, also it seemed to me, relating to some of the neighbors' uh, comments and also some of the comments of, of council, one of the big questions relates to what is the actual distance between the shoreline and this uh, shoal or island. So up, and again, I don't, pointer, 
Uh, so the distance from using this information from the townships of Georgia Bay's GIS mapping system, uh, we received a, a, a distance from this point to this point of 30.6 meters. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, you know, again, it's debatable because the shore is, is shaped, uh, but we're taking approximately half of the distance between the shoal and uh, the shoreline in terms of its location. One of the other things I just wanted to note very quickly, one of my client's concerns, as it is concern of the neighbors as well, is the wave action and the ice and wind. We would not be considering this at all if it weren't for this. So this in some respects is a double-edged sword. Uh, narrow water bodies means that we can't have a boat port. However, if this shoal wasn't here, it would be totally unprotected and I don't think would be viable. Uh, so the dimensions of the, both the actual boat port and the actual dock are uh, 46 feet square or 14.02 meters, uh, which is establishing the size both for the, the width of the boat port from the fascia to fascia uh, as well as the length of the, of the boat port. Uh, on this, I have uh, shown in red, uh, and that's the same in all the drawings, uh, lines that exhibit what we could do by right if we uh, have this shoal here, if it wasn't a narrow water body. We could have a much longer dock than what is, what is shown. Uh, the boat port uh, distance is uh, over uh, by about two meters, and this is to accommodate Mr. DeBoer's boats. Mr. DeBoer has two main boats and has additional boats as well, which we'll come back to as a conversation piece relating to the Moore Point issues, Moore Point cooperative issues. In order to uh, limit the amount of development on the shoreline, he is hoping to incorporate a uh, bit of a storage area on the dock, which is precipitating uh, needing a walkway uh, between the, the uh, bow of the boat and the uh, storage area, which is making the length of the boathouse, what it is, uh, and then also, so you can see the red line there, and also one of our minor potentially issues being that one section of dock, this being this one, uh, is over uh, by about 0 0.8.9 meters, which is about like this. The next slide. Uh, so again, we're noting the, the distances between the shoal and the, and the uh, actual dock. Uh, the storage area, the slip lengths, and the, in red line what we'd be able to do by right if we didn't have a narrow water bodies uh, issues there. So could you read off those numbers? Yeah. Sure. See what these numbers are. Of course. The distance. The distance. So, so would you like me to go through what? Well, just just the one at the top there, the, the one certainly from my perspective. No, well, the one, one. This one. That one. Yes. This one here. 14.39 meters. So, 50 feet. So in terms, so again, we'll, we'll get, come back to this in a minute. Um, any other questions relating to this diagram for any distances or? Okay. Uh, again, red lines show what we, the bylaw allows and what we're proposing. Uh, Mr. DeBoer has a 30 foot boat and I believe a 22 foot boat. Um, and so part of the concern was the height to allow for it to be properly lifted off of the dock and also the cottage uh, was not, the, the minor variance for the cottage had to do with uh, height of the building which was actually asked for was about two feet additional and then also a cupola. So it wasn't to do with additional GFA oversized or anything related to that, it was really to do with what was considered a minor variance for height. And in this situation, you can see here the difference between what is allowed, 4.0 meters and 4.45 meters to the center line. Uh, so uh, arguably relatively minor in terms of the actual distance. From, and again, these just wrap around throughout the application. Again, the red line for what is allowed, uh, the other drawing in terms of what is proposed. Okay, so, so really, our application has two major pieces. Two items relate to the narrow water bodies, and then the other four items relate to the actual boat port uh, 
itself. So relating to the, the narrow water bodies, proposal does not impact public health and safety as major navigation is to the west of the Rock Island, and we'll show a little of that in a minute. There's all charting and maps show all major uh, boat uh, traffic is to be to the outside of this uh, Rock Island. There is an understanding, of course, that uh, small craft, uh, paddle boards, kayaks, canoes, small motorized launches would, of course, want to take shelter behind shoals as part of the boating. I'm a boater as well uh, and understand this. So the proposal allows for, still allows for navigation of small watercraft such as canoes, kayaks, paddle boards, small motorized launches within that 14.39 meter distance. The narrow water bodies provision is to protect both sides of inhabited shorelines to allow for development so the development does not encroach and create a situation where development so overlaps that you're not allowed for navigable travel between narrow water bodies. In this situation, um, as I believe one of the councillors uh, discussed, it's not really an island, it's a shoal. Island in name, shoal in reality. So the narrow water body is, was my understanding in talking to planning staff was that largely for the official plan and also the provision and part of the bylaw is that it is to protect habitable situations. This is not that. The main channel of navigation is far to the west of the island and not between the island and the shoreline. There are other properties in the area that have boat ports and docks of similar size, not on this end point, which we'll get to in a minute because of wave action and so on. The proposal is for a floating steel dock that will have no impact on the lake bed. So again, some of the comments uh, from, from neighbors and so on uh, was that this was going to create a link between the, the shoal and the shoreline, uh, that this was going to be something hard and, and, and uh, attached to the, the shoreline, and, and it is not. Okay, so nautical charts. So there were some questions about depths. So this is a, uh, a chart, a GIS, uh, uh, or a tracking chart, uh, GPS, sorry, tracking chart. And you can see here, uh, this is that island. Uh, you can see the water depths are quite shallow. So again, anybody that is going between that rock island and that shoreline is not going to be going through there at you know, 30, 40 kilometers an hour. They are going to be creeping through. And I don't think that what we're proposing wouldn't allow for that. You can also see here this dotted line. This is the main uh, navigation in terms of along this shoreline with the understanding, and my, my, my client doesn't dispute that people you know, would want to take some, uh, a small craft through there, which I think also works with the definition of what navigation is. Uh, navigation doesn't just mean large boats, it also means small, but we still would allow for small boats to happen there. And as uh, the one councillor said, uh, no one's going to be taking a cabin cruiser uh, between that rock island and this shoreline. Can I make a comment? <clears throat> of course. I have to visit the boys who have too many cups, cups of coffee this morning, so can we take them? Break for about three minutes. Yep. Your calls. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> Not up to me.
so well, that's the kitchen concern. <coughs> we, could we get the property started? Has concerns of the top of the kitchen. If you could continue with your um, presentation. I don't think everybody's back. Well, I mean, I started a, a trend, I realize that. I resume. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just go to the next slide. So an increase in boat port height. I'm just going through the issues. The one at the bottom uh, is one that meets uh, all the provisions of the bylaw, except for the narrow water body issues, which we've talked about as being uh, sort of two months. The upper one is the application or proposed application. So you can see from a massing perspective, there's not a whole lot of difference between one to the other. Yes, one is taller, and I think that's perceived, uh, but not, not, not hugely. Uh, the orientation of the adjacent cottages on the property, you'll see that in a minute. I have a, a very brief video that shows uh, the shoreline, uh, which I'll show there. Um, everyone kind of faces out in different directions, so it's not like in some situations where you have a, a convex or a cove where people are overlooking each other uh, as they view out to, out to the lake. Uh, an increase in length, uh, so the length of the, of the boat port is being established by the size of the boat that Mr. DeBoer has uh, and allowing to be able to walk around the, the, the bottom uh, or the bow of the, of the, uh, the U-shaped dock and also the request or, or hope to have storage on the, on the dock as opposed to having to develop um, something else on the shoreline. Allow for a decrease in eave overhang. The bylaw requires that there be a minimum eave overhang of 0.6 meters, or basically two feet, in order to, again, accommodate the dimensions of the boat uh, and the dock and the, the walking around the, the open slip. Uh, the uh, structure has been pushed out to the edges of the eaves in, in three locations, not the major locations, in terms of out to shoreline and to the uh, to the uh, northwest um, in order to accommodate that. Increase of allowable dock width. So again, um, the red line is what is required by bylaw. So we are looking at uh, about a little bit less than a meter, 0 0.88 uh, meters of uh, increase to allow for circulation around uh, both the open slip and the storage area. So I'm mean, very briefly going to address some questions that I saw within the, the three letters uh, comment. So navigation questions. Uh, navigation for small watercraft can still be achieved, achieved between the, the proposed dock and the Rock Island, 14.39 meters. The Rock Island, while allowing for wave and wind protection for the proposed dock and Beauport, would allow for a very short interval of protection for other craft navigating the Moore Point shoreline. Proposed dock would not block the narrow water body of approximately 30.6 meters, leaving 14.39 for small watercraft to navigate the shore. So that's at least our, our brief synopsis of that. Environment, there was also some environmental questions relating to our, our application. There is no type one fish habitat along this section of shoreline, and this has been confirmed with the planning department. The project is developed to meet or exceed provincial and federal policy for shoreline development, discussed with the township planning department as well. Proposed dock is a steel floating dock that does not bear on the lake bed, creating very low impact to aquatic flora and fauna. Wind wave and ice conditions. The Boers would not consider installing a fixed dock in this location unless the Rock Island was there. So as I said, there's, there's two situations and we can, this is still under discussion, uh, but the, we understand, and again, Mr. DeBoer and his family have been uh, uh, cottagers in Georgian Bay for many years has seen what can happen. But in this location, the Rock Island and shoreline would allow for a floating steel dock boat port to be safely installed with island blocking prevailing winds, waves, and ice. a and Services, who uh, my client is working with, uh, has a long history of developing floating docks and boat ports that can withstand the severe weather of Georgian Bay. The Brewers have no intention of creating structures that would be hazardous to navigation or could cause damage to neighboring properties. There was some, some concern or some questions 
relating to other docks that were shown, which were fixed docks that were broken apart, debris going all over uh, neighboring properties. As a floating dock, a floating steel dock, we were also in discussion about whether or not the dock, could act dock and Beauport could actually be moved seasonally uh, for any concerns relating to ice and stored somewhere else uh, along a shoreline. Uh, that is something that's been proposed by A and A. Uh, so for all those reasons, those are our questions, and these are still questions for us. Uh, so contextual questions. There are a history of other docks and boat ports within the area of Moore Point. I'll be showing that in a minute. Moor Point and the shoreline surrounding this area has a number of large cottages and shoreline development. While a beautiful shoreline, this area is not an undeveloped shoreline with only natural features to be seen from the water or land. This is a developed area. Of course, it's a cottage area. Of course, everyone is here to have uh, the, uh, to enjoy the environment and the water waves and the land. Uh, but this isn't a pristine shore that has no other development. Uh, so I, we believe that the proposed development is in keeping within the context of uh, other development that is occurring in this area of, of Georgian Bay. So I'm going to see if this works, um, but I have a very brief, uh, about two minute uh, drone uh, video. It was just taken on Friday. so. Showing it coming up. Okay, I have the link, so it's all. Are you finished with your presentation? I am. The only, the only one thing I've asked, because of the, the late coming comments by neighbours and some discussion relating to the Moore Point Cooperative, uh, my client has asked, uh, asked respectfully to Council that we defer any judgment relating to this application until we have more information, have had more opportunity to discuss the application with neighbours and any of their concerns. Well, that makes the decision easy, but we should still hear from. Well, of course, of course. That we should still hear from all of the neighbors and their comments. My, my sorry, I just one more thing. Um, my client has also asked because I know he's a, he's a newcomer to Moore Point, that he be able to after the neighbors have commented to also comment uh, personally on the on the on the proposal. Be very brief. Who would like to start? Of the yeah. Well, let's watch that. Oh, you've got it going. Okay, fine. Sorry. the Rock Island the property. That was the bay in the Moore Point Cooperative uh, dock and, and boathouse. There's the construction as it's happening. This is into the bay to the south uh, east. So you can see again uh, the development or the context of development uh, near this near this property. Final view that kind of is an overview of the, the whole point and the adjacent bays to either side.
Yes, sir. Your name? May I approach? Yes. Greg Perry. Yes, Greg. Good morning. I should have recognized you. Sorry. So, we're nearly new, but I can still say good morning to Council. Thank you very much for having us. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I enjoyed that presentation from Mr. Crozer. Thank you for that. Um, we also attempted to fly a drone to get some nice footage for today, but we, when, we, when we got close to our property line, it said no fly zone. So we were, we were abruptly <laughs> kicking out of the air, later Smith area, to attest to that. Uh, and that was over 240 Orville Road. I don't know why that exists, but it's it's weird. It's out there. Uh, this is the first time I, I've had a chance to uh, have it yet, but it DeBoer, pleasure. Uh, the project started in 2016. We had our first conversation last Tuesday. Um, so finally we, we meet. That's that's great, and hopefully we can keep our lines of communication open. Um, I think it's very important to to uh, also point out, uh, I've been a resident at 246 Moore Point, the property immediately south to uh, the divorce, since 1986. So in 31 years, I've seen a lot on that point. Um, my brother uh, lived next door to me, and uh, we own that now. We bought that property, uh, and we have seen tremendous uh, damage over the seasons. We've seen tremendous damage over the years, and you know, all this, all this talk about a protective shoal, or I call it an island because it is an island, and however small it is, um, it's not going to afford the protection that is required for such a superstructure that's being proposed here. I can tell you that adamantly. Um, I have some very good friends and neighbors here with me as well today. I have John Cady, who lives immediately north of the 240 Point Road, uh, adjoining property. Uh, Don Whitfield who's been a Moore Point resident, I think, since about the same time, uh, 1986. Uh, Fred Waring, who was three doors north on the same shore. Uh, Fred's been here uh, with me at least 15 years. And, um, and uh, you'll probably hear comments from John Cady as well. You'll hear comments from, from um, hopefully, Don Whitfield. Don mentioned to me earlier this morning that you know he uses this channel um, himself. His, his grandkids use the channel in um, in motorboats, uh, that is the narrow channel between the Mark Channel and the shoreline, and it's it's really comes down to, you know, a protective uh, spot in a really really treacherous shoreline because it is treacherous. There's no question about it. There's seven lots that are on that shoreline. All seven um, have tried various um, structures, and nothing of any magnitude compared to what's being proposed here today, and and um, almost all of them have failed over the years. Um, myself being one of them. Uh, the only option we saw when we con when we consulted with Taylor Dock, who installed our dock uh, for the first time 10 years ago, was what's known as a tower dock. So the whole thing lifts up in the winter like this, and all the decking is removed, and and it lasted 10 years, and that's about the best you're going to get. Um, sooner or later, you get a storm that that wreaks havoc, and and you know it's it's going to it's going to really really um, play a role in this. There's no question about it. Um, I think it's very important, you know, I, I did submit a letter, I'm not going to go through it word by word, but I'm just going to highlight some of the points here for uh, Council to consider. Um, you know, it, it, it's definitely um, an environmental area, there's no question. You know, it's, it's designated such and such, so be it. You know, if it doesn't enter into the conversation, so be it. But we have to recognize sooner or later that, you know, the more we, the more we impede in the environment, the worse it's going to get for us as, a, as an overall plan. That's the message there. A narrow channel is very, very navigable. Um, I use it, uh, my whole family uses it, my neighbors use it, as, as you'll see. Um, locals use it to fish a lot, and um, there, you, know, you can't deny the fact that it's a huge channel. And just like the rest of the, 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 the Honey Harbor area, and 30,000 islands for that matter, there are so many back channels that aren't marked, that they don't show any depth point charts. And this is, this is common knowledge that people use them and they know it's a safe passageway. And this is extra important because in inclement weather, it adds safety to it. And so that's very, very important here, and, and not to underestimate it. You know, the site plan that came up on one of the slides, I had a copy of it here this morning as well, that uh, Mr. Crozier put up there. You know, I, I, I stress the fact, look, you know, it, it, 
the island is pointed out on the site map as, as GIS or whatever the technology is, but it still says that, that it's, it's, it's not accurate, it's, it's approximated. So we really need to do some more research here and, and determine what the exact measurements are. Not just measurements between island and, and, uh, and land, but also island land at low water and high level, and also depth of water at low level and high water. Because the number that's accurate from this diagram, which says it's inaccurate because of the position of the island, but what it does say is they're going to occupy 64% of the channel, not nearly half, 64%. So that's another 14% more than 50%. And so that leaves us with, do the math, 36% of channel. That's navigable now. And that channel happens to be the part of the channel which is, which is coming off of that shoal, and it's a very shallow shoal, so it's very shallow water. So one of the councillors, I forget which one, I'm sorry, they mentioned safe passageway at night. Think of it. You know, you're, you're eliminating 64% of the safe passageway, um, and at night, if, if it's not lit, and you know, these are things to consider. I'm not saying don't do it, but these are things that need, have to be considered. So that's a very, very important point, I feel, is, is you know, what, what's the real map and what's it look like? Um, you know, the, the, I, I've gone through that. Someone brought up, you know, has, have federal agencies been, been informed of this? Well, you know, Transport Canada, the Navigation Protection Act, I mean, I haven't dug into it, but, you know, these are critical, critical aspects of what we're talking about here today. Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, you know, again, it, it, we need detailed analysis on this. Um, so, you know, the weather conditions, as I mentioned when I started, are, are, are nothing to be, you know, taken, take, take, taken lightly here. Um, Jim Smith, you didn't mention a submission from Jim Smith. He's here today. Jim sent some photos in. Did they, <coughs> I don't know if, if, if the council has seen these photographs. We're happy to put them up there. But these are um, amazing photographs from over the years. And Jim's been a resident for, for 30 some odd years at Moore Point. And the destruction that the ice shows in these photographs that Jim has given is, is substantial. And uh, me personally, in 1986, I was clearing my lot to build. And that spring, when the ice was breaking up, I sat and watched ice build up 10 to 12 feet high in about 20 minutes on my shoreline. And this was late March. So nothing gets in the way of this. You can't stop it. It's gonna move anything, okay? And you know, you have gale force winds. I mean, the other night, I think it was uh, Thursday night, Fred was here, and, um, and, um, and, um, I'll let you read this, Fred. I don't have my glasses on. Oh, those were pictures. Oh, okay, these are Smith's pictures. Happy to share these. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we had a gale going on up here, and just read the, read the, we get winds that are, that are substantial on an ongoing basis. Okay, so, you know, we have this superstructure, and, and people have tried it. You know, Art Mesher is another good example. Art is a resident of Moore Point, and Art built out um, a U-shaped dock to accommodate his boat, just a flat U-shaped floating dock. And he has a 38-foot boat. And this dock, he's, he's facing more southwesterly, and this dock was, was, um, was broken up, smashed, um, and had to be repaired three times. His boat was washed up, his 38-foot boat washed up on rocks twice. And this is what goes on. And, you know, if, 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 if you think that little island is going to protect a mammoth structure like that, forget it. It's not going to happen. You know, you have to look at it from the point of view, and this relates to safe boating, okay? We've all done a lot of boating. We all know Georgia Bay inside and out. And what this proposal encompasses is building out a 48 by 48 foot boat, because it's a floating structure, that will be anchored but it's the roof, okay? You have, if you look at that diagram, and again, if Mr. Crozier wants to put it up, I have printed. But if you look at that diagram, that roof line at the peak is just over 20 feet from what I can, what I can gather. I'm sure Mr. Crozier can verify this. So when you, when you look at the difference between the open area, and of course you have the small cabin that closes that off underneath the one roof, but you have about 10 feet of roof sticking up. And so that 10 feet of roof by 48 feet, let's, let's say, give or take, that's sail area if you equate it to a sailboat. So you have a 48 by 48 foot sailboat at anchor in gale force winds with sails up. It's not going to work. No, no sailor in his right mind would do that, 
So, you know, I don't want to be blunt or, or crass, but we really need to think about this before anything happens. And that, that's, that's, that's the point I wanted to make. Um, from Moore Point's perspective, uh, I'm a director, I've been a director of Moore Point since day one, since the 80s. Um, Moore Point is a phenomenal community. We all, we all love and respect Moore Point. Moore Point has brought a lot to the township and will continue to bring a lot to the township. And, and it's all about community. You know, and people need to to um, to understand. And Art Mesher related in a phone call I had one on Sunday, really, really well. And he had an instance where where a neighbor of his owned an adjacent lot, and he indicated he would sell it to Art um, when he was ready. And Art wanted to buy it to to keep it vacant to preserve its beautiful, beautiful property. And so the Farracutis, who are not residents anymore, um, they they uh, ended up purchasing the lot instead of art from from the grosses and um, and uh, Tony Paracuti and Art had a gentleman's agreement that that if Tony wanted to sell it, Art would get first rate re refusal. Tony passed away. Tony's son David sold the lot, but it didn't get sold to Art. So um, you know a bit of a bit of misunderstanding, but also a bit of you know negative sentiment between. Um, between Art and Dr. Gross. When Art rebuilt his place, uh, Dr. Gross approached Art and, and asked, um, you know, if you don't mind, please don't build anything to obstruct my view. And and Art could have, you know, taken, well, you know, you know, eye for eye approach to this, but he didn't. And he respected Dr. Gross's request. And he had his designers and his builders and everyone involved in the project go to Dr. Gross's place and look at it and make sure that anything was built that was designed to build didn't obstruct his view. Well, that's the way Moore Point is from a neighborly perspective. And we need to preserve that. And I know I'm going off on a soliloquy, but it's to me, it's what a big part of what life is all about. Fred, um, he's going to come up and talk from Moore Point's perspective, but. Um, you know, when the township needs specific details about Moore Point and how it's set up. See, the thing is, we have a marina. It's shown beautifully in the drone footage. Thank you for that. That marina is unbelievably well protected. And those two boathouses, the floating boathouses that were in that footage, are, are in that protected bay. It's a completely different set of circumstances. And so, you know, these boathouses have bubblers all winter long, but they don't, you don't get any ice movement in the spring. You don't, you know, you get some wind, but nothing as extreme as, as, as the shoreline we're talking about here. But that marina, you know, it has held boats ranging in size from, you know, 10 feet to 45 feet without any, any occurrence uh, over the past 30, 31 years. And as a member, that, uh, the divorce um, are because they're waterfront owners and that membership passed when they, when they, when they acquired the, the property. They have access to this marina. You know, and and you know, it's, it, it, everyone at Moore Point loves to dream of waking up in the morning, having a coffee, and in my bare feet go down and hop on my boat and spend the day in the boat and come back in my bare feet and hop back out. And, and but no, we have to you know walk a few minutes to the protected marina, and yeah, maybe it's a bit of a hassle, but you're guaranteed protection. And and you know, I didn't even touch on if this thing. If and when this thing breaks loose, because you know it's not if it's when, and that thing starts drifting, and the immensity of it, you know, think of the damage it's going to it's going to wreak on on neighboring shorelines, and then it's going to take off if it's a northwest, and it'll end up in Port McNichol or Victoria Harbor, and it'll just keep doing damage, damage, damage. So, you know, I leave it at that. But please, others come up and and um, and comment. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Others want to come up, please. <clears throat> State your name uh, for the record. And My name is John Cady. And uh, my wife and I own the property adjacent to the north, to the subject lands. Um, I sent in a letter of objection. Uh, I'm not going to go through it, but there's two points on there that I'd like to, to repeat on. One is the uh, restricted body of water. The pictures that were shown are, are very nice, but uh, you should also note that the water right now is the highest I've ever seen it. We've owned the property since 1999. And because of that, the island is much smaller than, than 
it typically is. Uh, I know that with climate change and all the questions, uh, four or five years ago, the water lakes were at the lowest level and they were going to keep getting lower, and now all of a sudden they're at the highest levels. Yeah. So there's variation with that. So taking measurements to the island as it stands today, I don't think is truly representative of what it is as far as the width of the channel. Um, I swim in that channel. I swim back and forth in there all summer long. Uh, other people swim across there. There's kayakers, there's, there's uh, paddle boards, there's boats going through. And at the lowest point, when the water was the lowest, there was 11 feet of depth through that channel. I, I know I swam. So uh, I think that question was asked earlier about the water depth. The water depth is in the middle of the channel, not right beside the island. So that, right now, with their structure, it's going to impinge on the deepest part of, of the water throughout the channel. The, the, I, I think those are the two main things that I'd like to, to mention about that. Greg did a very good job of, of uh, summarizing most of my other uh, kind of objections with that. Now, the other thing is the danger and the safety issue of the um, being exposed to the weather. Uh, for a large part of my career, I was a commercial diver. I worked in the water or on the water seven days a week, five days a week, whatever. I know the power that water has. I know the power that ice has. I did a lot of work in the Arctic. Since we've been there, I've seen ice wrapped up. It only happens once in the spring when break up. Pictures that were shown showed the ice formed. It wasn't moving, it was solid. In the spring, when it starts to move, as, as Greg said, there's no power that's going to stop. And I've seen ice raft up and go over top of that island as if it wasn't there. Uh, the other thing is that the island really only provides protection from the northwest, the north and northwest. From the southwest, it's a straight reach across to Midland, which is the longest reach across the Sound which gives the water the biggest opportunity, the best opportunity to create large, very large waves. And they roll right in behind the island. The, the island offers no protection to where they're planning on putting the, the, the uh, boat pole. So I think that I agree with, with Greg's uh, summary that it's not if this is going to be damaged, it's when it's going to be damaged. And um, I know that People have gone by in boats and said, oh, that looks like it's protected when it's been rough out. But I've also seen it many, many times when it's not protected because the wind is just veered enough that it blows right into that, into that channel. Um, I think that's everything that, that I can add to what's been said so far. Thank you. <coughs> Who's next? Fred? <coughs> uh, I'm Fred Waring. I'm a resident of Moore Point as well. Um, Pat, can I bring these pictures up? Yes, definitely. I'm not going to beat a drum to death here. Um, um, John and, uh, and uh, Greg have stated the facts. We, did, we sent out a little memo to uh, all the Moore Point residents, and um, uh, we have 44 members in Moore Point. We got 14 responses, 12 were against, two were non committal, uh, and basically the against, the largest portion of the against was because, like Greg and John said, we all know that it's not going to last. It's going to break up and get destroyed. Collateral damage to neighbors next door. Um, there was some, some comments of uh, creating precedents, you know, but personally I wasn't worried about the precedent because after that thing breaks up, if it gets approved, Nobody's going to want to do it again. So, um, last, you know, um, you commented about uh, the snow last year, the pictures that were taken of 
We had no snow last year. We had very little ice last year. Last year was a, a very abnormal year. Uh, winter with lots of ice and lots of snow like we get at least 50% of the time paints a completely different picture and those, those pictures you see up there show it. We have the marina around the corner. Uh, the moors have one space in that marina, uh, but we always have a pool of at least a half a dozen spaces available for rent. So there's no shortage of dockage space in that uh, little marina. Um, and as Greg said and John said, it can, it's handled 42 foot boats, so it can handle most any size boat. The, I have a dock in front of my place. I've had it uh, ripped away two or three times. I've had the ice come up underneath my deck that's part of the dock and lift it up. And I've had to replace cement pylons underneath it. The power of the ice and the wind in that area is beyond belief and you have to live there to see it. Thank you very much. Anybody else? That's the case, we'll close that off and bring it into council uh, for council comments. I would point out that we are down to one point on the resolution because the request of the applicant is to not uh, put the uh, bylaw in place at this point. So what we would be considering would be, be it resolved that council directs staff to consider the comments re received for the zoning bylaw 17 slash 18, 240 Moore Point Road and prepare a recommendation report and bylaw that will be brought back to subsequent council meeting for consideration. So that is what is on the table. So I would be suggesting that council should give us additional comments as to <coughs> things that they are going to want staff to look at. That would be my suggestion. Uh, Kathy. Oh, he brought it in yet? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question for either Jamie or Lori. Jamie or Lori, uh, Kathy's asking. I have a question for you. Yes. As councillor, dealing with the zoning bylaw amendment, are we, de we dealing with bricks and mortar? Can we be affected by weather? Can weather make a decision? Uh, can we make a decision based on the fact that the weather could rip this thing out? Or are we only concerned with the fact that it is within a narrow waterway? I mean, I know we're concerned about now we're just talking about that, so I'll let him uh, answer that question. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, there is a health and safety component associated with planning decisions. Uh, the provincial policy statement has health and safety policies in it. Um, the township official plan and district official plan have policies related to that. So that is something that, that would be a consideration going forward from a planning perspective. So. Thank you. It's one of the considerations. Can I just mention, I apologize, is mm -hmm. that um, the applicant did make a request um, when, the, uh, when the agent was speaking, the agent requested that the owner have an opportunity to <coughs> briefly address council after the public comment. Mm -hmm. So I know that was a request that was made. And I just wanted to make sure that if you want to do it now or after you've heard our comments, I mean, I think we're down to just the, the, the one resolution at this okay. point. I'll leave it up to the applicant. Would you like to speak now or after you hear the comments from the rest of the subject? And I don't know whether I'm doing something that's against, <laughs> against the procedural rule, but... It was, it was closed to the public? Yes. So before we go any further with council, we can reopen it again since that was a request that was made okay. if you would like to speak. Okay, we'll uh, reopen it.
application of this zoning bylaw and needs that narrow body is not really being applied fairly because low traffic does not go through there. As shown in the charts and by Kevin's presentation, all the low traffic goes on the west side of that island. Um, all the aids to navigation clearly state uh, you go around the west side of that island, you don't go through that channel. Danger, don't go through there. So, <clears throat> I've also, you know, I haven't uh, lived there, as Greg uh, and John have mentioned, uh, they see occasional old traffic go through there, small craft perhaps, but uh, since the time we've owned the property, I've never seen a boat go through that channel. Sorry, I've been boating in Georgian Bay for uh, uh, many, many years and gone around Moore Point a hundred times and I've never seen a boater uh, ignore all the aids to navigation and say, um, which they go around the west side of the island and say, no, I think I'll go through that narrow channel and see what happens. I've never seen that um, because there are shoals on either side of that, sh uh, uh, side of that little rock island and uh, it's dangerous. So, um, now I know our neighbors have said that uh, the local people use that as a, uh, you know, as a, a safe passage in, uh, in rough weather conditions through the channel, and I accept that, and no reason to doubt that. However, um, and what I'd say to that is not, we're not requesting to block off that channel. Uh, we're leaving passage through it. And uh, also, it's only offering protection for a short distance of about 150 feet, maybe, and then you're open to the full west wind of uh, coming into Moore Point again. So it's not a lot of protection, but I understand that uh, some local residents may go through there. But regarding the weather conditions, um, I've also spoken to uh, my neighbors on that and agree with their assessment that that it's hazardous on Moore Point. Um, they, they told me about their dark damage that they've experienced themselves. Um, and I would agree that that would happen. I also spoke to Art a Mesher, who has a dock around the far side of um, Moore Point and received uh, and, and had damage there as well. But the fact is that we're not proposing to put this boat port in front of their properties, which are exposed to the full southwest wind of Moore Point. We're, at, we're proposing to put it in the sheltered area between the Rock Island and our shoreline. There's a natural breakwater with the, uh, with the island. And that's one of the main reasons we bought that property is because there is a, that natural uh, breakwater with that Rock Island that we could put at the very least a dock and perhaps a covered dock, which is what we're proposing. As far as all the concerns about winter conditions, uh, we need to look at that a bit further, but the proposal right now would be to pull the boat port out of there and store it in, in safe storage for the winter due to ice flow. So we understand the uh, concerns brought forward and um, the concern for preserving the, uh, the beauty of the shoreline and all I can say to that is that um, we're not proposing a massive boathouse but rather a boat port. There's boat ports all over Georgian Bay. Uh, we've had a cottage there for 10 years and there's boat ports around the corner from us and uh, they're all over the Cognachine area where we are now. So I think that's in keeping with um, you know, the shoreline structures on Georgian Bay. So that's basically all I have. Thank you. I'll bring it back into council then. Uh, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, the local residents that have been there for a number of years have a pretty good idea of what the weather conditions can be like. I, I can speak uh, from my own personal experience on Georgian Bay all my life. Um, I, uh, I have a U-shaped dock. Uh, that uh, is fortunately protected by one island and then 80 kilometers across 
Georgian Bay. One island, though, is one kilometer long, not a shoal. And uh, I still face very tough weather conditions uh, with that very large break wall, very long break wall. And so um, I, I think from a safety perspective, that uh, the, the, for a couple of different reasons. One is just the, the sheer distances that, that are here. I, I would suggest that uh, we really need to take a very careful look at the distances between uh, the, the uh, structure and where the wind can actually come from. From the southwest, I measured six kilometers. From the west, I less, uh, measured six kilometers. Maybe from the southwest, it's even further because of uh, coming out of Midland Bay. And to the northwest, to the bottom of Beausoleil Island, uh, about six kilometers. That's a long way. So we're talking about in, in, in gale force winds, six, seven, and even eight foot seas. Um, that can cause a lot of damage. Regardless of ice in the winter, that's, that's just, ice in the winter is so powerful that uh, this, this couldn't possibly stay there. Um, but I, I just uh, would like to say that that is a concern uh, for the owner, and uh, the other thing I would like to say is that from a safety perspective, people will take the shortest distance between two points, and it's not going out around a shoal. If they're in a small tin boat, they're going to be going along the shoreline, and that's how they'll get from point A to point B. And I'm sure lots of people locally, that's, that's the channel that they take. They don't go bother going out and around, they go through there, and that happens all over cottage country. You go the shortest distance, and, and if we're taking that channel basically down from you know, uh, uh, basically 30 meters across, 26 meters, whatever the measurement is in high or low water, by about half or more, depending on how you measure everything, uh, I think that becomes a, a safety hazard, especially uh, in, in fog conditions, in, in uh, darker conditions, early morning, late evening, that would be very concerning. So those are my comments. Thanks, Peter. Paul? I just have one new point, but I just want to summarize a few other points. I think Greg brought up a, a good point. I already written it down, but uh, I think you're looking at, uh, with the shoal there, yes, the shoal will help somewhat protect the swells and the waves, but you're looking at about a 40 by 40 uh, size parachute and being held down with guide wires. And I think at some time, at some point, the wind's got to get under that structure, and if it doesn't, uh, uh, break loose uh, from the, uh, the pillars themselves, it's going to put a big stress on the anchorage of that, uh, of that uh, boat port. And anchorage, it sounds like it might be connected every year. So it makes it somewhat uh, questionable each year how the connections are made, were they made properly and so on. So I think you're looking at a hazard down the way on that one. Um, the other issue, too, is that uh, there is two docks associated with uh, this uh, boat port, and there's two sides to each dock. So if there was a dock on the outside towards the shore, uh, if you put, if you, it looks like you, if you, you could dock a boat there, so that would even make their uh, passage even narrower. And of course, now we're looking at high water, high water of our point right here, so if the water drops another three feet, who knows what that distance is going to be between a boat parked on the one side and the shoal itself. So basically, I think you're pretty well destroying the, any safe passage through that shore. Uh, the other issue that was brought up quite clearly that uh, you did get the opinions uh, uh, of the local residents, and it seems to be unanimous opinion that uh, we're looking at a future hazard here. And, um, and I think we should, you should listen uh, to, to what they have to say. And that's all I have to say. Cynthia? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. I mean, everybody's covered this inside and out, including the neighbors and the owners. Um, I would look forward to getting a report back from staff on the safety issues because I think that uh, seems to be one of the um, biggest concerns here on both navigation and on uh, collateral damage. So. I would look forward to that report coming back and uh, having further conversation at that point. And thank you for the presentations from all of you. They were both uh, very informative. Thank you, Cynthia. The things that I've written down, uh, 
I assume there has been no correspondence from, as district made a comment, they did make a comment and they said they were okay. No concerns. No concerns. The, the, the people that should be, uh, we should be asking are the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the responsibility for the water and I would like to make sure that we're contacting them uh, to get their input. Uh, so the items I had on my list were, I think we need to know the location, so we do need a survey to know exactly what that distance is across to the island. Uh, I certainly share the concerns with regard to the size, the view, uh, the precedent we may be setting, and one of the things that uh, I think we want to make sure is that we're not allowing something to happen which is bound for failure. So I think we need an engineering report. I gather you're a, an architect, is that correct? So um, I think we need an engineering report on this because I think you could have a 40 foot square sail taking off and you know we've all, all of us on Georgian Bay know what that force is and that's why almost everybody if they have the choice they will dock on the east side of their island not the west side of their island. So. I think we've made a, a laundry list to go back to, uh, to planning and to go back for uh, their review and input and uh, I obviously encourage all of the neighbors to talk on all of these issues because you're all in a cooperative, you're all in a special area all together and I think it's very important that everybody be having good relations. I mean, it's so important up here uh, when you have neighbors next door. So with that, I turn it back to Jamie and there's your mar marching orders as to, uh, I think uh, everybody wants the fullest uh, possible uh, review of this because of the concerns raised. So uh, we will be, uh, the resolution that I'm going to read is only the, the one to have, um, further consideration, therefore, the, read as follows. Be it resolved, the council directs staff to consider the comments received for the zoning bylaw 17 slash 18 to 40 Moore Point Road and prepare a recommendation report and bylaw that will be brought back to a subsequent council meeting for consideration. Those in favor? Nobody opposed. So that's what we'll be having. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you.
Take it. We have people here for the next application, too. Okay. Um, did you want to hear it now or break for lunch? Now would be good. Now would be good. Okay. Sorry, Council. Be, be, be careful on that one. This is a property in Cog Machine. It's, it's a property that, well, we'll, we'll go, we'll, sorry, we'll go back one here. So here's the location of the subject lands. It's, uh, it's in a small bay. The adjacent lands to the west are a national park site. There's currently a cottage and a sleeping cabin on the property. It, the sleeping cabin was a former boat, dry land boathouse that has been converted to a sleeping cabin. Effectively, what the, what the applicants want to do is reverse it. So the, what's now a sleeping cabin will become the dwelling, and what's now the dwelling will become the sleeping cabin. So, so uh, that's, and the reason for the official plan amendment portion of the application is because the dwelling is located slightly closer to the front lot line or the high water mark than where the sleeping cabin is and we're not allowed a sleeping cabin in the front yard so that's why there's an official plan amendment application in place with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment application the zoning bylaw amendment application is to permit a few variances from the bylaw both for the new dwelling which is now the sleeping cabin and then also for a reduced setback for a septic system. There's currently a septic system on the property. Um, because they are proposing to expand what's going to be the dwelling, which is now the sleeping cabin, it precipitates a larger septic system to be installed on the property. And the current location of the septic system doesn't meet the zoning bylaw requirements. The new one proposes a 19 meter setback to the high water mark where the the official plan and the bylaw require a 30 meter setback to the high water mark so that's basically the the gist of what the proposed amendments are uh, so here's a site plan of the proposed application and uh, this is the location right now on the westerly portion of the property that's the existing cottage or the dwelling that's proposed to be converted to the sleeping cabin. This here, this white area, that's the existing sleeping cabin that's proposed to be modified to a dwelling. And then the addition is this area that's shaded. So that's the area of the addition. Um, so the area of the addition is sort of interior to the site. It, it really won't be that visible from the neighboring property that's in this area. There is an addition that's proposed to the back there's a fairly decent buffer along the side. There's some existing uh, coniferous pines, some pine trees in this area. Um, there's a, there's a low-lying portion of the property that goes through here. So they've identified where the location of the high water mark is. That's this hatching area. And they've identified it here. The existing septic system is right there. So it's quite close to where the high water mark is right now. The new septic system location is proposed to be in this area. Uh, the surveyor has identified that a 20 meter setback, um, this, this, uh, this proposed, uh, this survey came in after the application was submitted and the application requested a 19 meter setback. Out of an abundance of caution, we're saying let's stick with the 19 meter setback, depending on how that, that design gets completed. But um, that's sort of the lay of the land. There is no neighbor on this side. This side, there is an existing residential property in this area. There's a non-complying setback that exists right here for that existing cottage. It's 0 0.4 meters, uh, but that's an existing situation. And to my understanding, that predated the zoning bylaw for the municipality, the construction of that cottage. So that's, that's an overview. 
I would characterize the proposed addition to this building as being a quite modest size addition. It's not a, it's not a monster cottage by any means. It's quite, quite a small addition. It's, uh, I believe it's one bedroom. It's adding an additional bedroom to that cottage and some living space. So, so that's the, the gist of the proposed application. Um, this is the, the existing cottage. So this figure identifies the conversion. Right now it's, a, it's one bedroom and uh, the kitchen will be modified. This is the, the proposed new, uh, the addition. So they're proposing a couple bedrooms across the back and then a living area, dining area in the front. So it's fairly modest in terms of its size. The overall width of it's 42 feet. Here's some pictures from the site. Um, just a second here. So that's a picture of the of the existing sleeping cabin that's getting modified to be a dwelling. So it's proposed to be added onto the back and to the side of it. You can just see through the trees here. This is the existing existing cottage. This is the area of low-lying land that goes across the middle of the site that I mentioned the high water mark comes through. Uh, this is the existing cottage as seen from the water. This is the cottage that's to be converted to the sleeping cabin. Here's a view from the, from the water. So this is the sleeping cabin that's being converted to, the, to a new cottage. You can see the neighboring property here to the east. This is the existing cottage that's proposed to be modified to a sleeping cabin. So that's an, an overview of the, uh, of the proposed application. I'll just go back to, the, uh, to that slide. We'll leave it there. But um, that summarizes my presentation. Okay. I'll come to council for questions after. Um, do you have a comment? One letter of support was received from Dr. Gregory Gaffney, the Ministry of Natural Resources and the District of Muskoka have no objections and one letter of objection was received from Kathy Cooper. Okay, uh, so I know the applicants here. Do you have anything you wish to add to uh, Jamie's presentation? Yes, uh, my name is Kurt Brand. Uh, I just wanted to say that we also went to the Cotton Machine Cottage Association and had them out and discussed with them what our plans were, showed where the septic was going to be, that we wanted to change the cottage to a bunkie, and of course the bunkie to a cottage. This uh, actually is beneficial also environmentally in that the main use property now closest to the water would be reduced to uh, occasional use. It's for when the grandkids are there and I gotta get away. And the cottage then is further set back. Um, so it's, it's a win-win. The existing septic system, we don't want to put any more load of any kind on it. There is the capacity to add a bedroom to the boathouse and bathroom facilities or you know, fixtures were within fixtures but not bedrooms so we could add more to it but it's an older septic system so our hopes is that we put in a new one spend the money put in a new one put in a good one and not not put any more pressure there um, the Bylaw states that it should be 30 meters from high water. We realize that. Uh, however, the province of Ontario, we do meet that at 15. There is no other location that we can put it. It is very specifically located on the site plan. And uh, that is it. It can only be there because we now have it six meters from the neighbor's property. We did keep it 30 meters from the water itself. The low area in the back uh, has got trees in it and uh, spring runoff goes through there. But by June, end of June, there's no water running through the little creek that goes under the walkway into the bay. The runoff's all gone through in the little. 
So that's what we're asking for is to be able to put an addition on the back and do a uh, the m &R had no concerns about fish habitat because we were moving over the main use. Uh, they had concerns about uh, fox snake habitat. So we had an environmentalist come out and he did a survey and contacted the m &R who have cleared the way for us. Um, also, <clears throat> to increase our front yard, uh, we we're in the process of purchasing the shore allowance from the m &R. The crown through the engineer. So we've uh, we've been working on this for about a year and a half. We actually came to the township and talked to planning and building department before we purchased the property. We said what it was that we wanted to do, and we're told it, you know, sounded viable. So we proceeded. So we're here now, looking to get approval to proceed with this, so we can start in the spring. Any questions? Well, I, I guess well, I'll link the questions. I have questions with regard to the map. I'll wait until it comes back to council. Yeah. I guess. We'll deal with questions when it, when I bring it away from the uh, public. So I'll go to the public now. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak to this application? see any so I will bring it into uh, council's hands and I know Councillor Rianco had his hand up there a minute ago so go ahead. Well I'm just pointing and just trying to make a clarification of some of the numbers here. This is an Iowa So it does meet a 30 meter setback from here. But the it, high water mark. Yeah, it's this high water mark at the back because the high water mark actually swings around. Okay, so this is actually this is this is the water. Well, it's the one set. It's the contour. Yeah. So if the water were to get to the high water mark, it would also fill this area back here. Okay, so this is where you have the, the 19. Yeah, this is where the 19 meter setback is here. From the actual shoreline, if you're looking at it from a boat, it would meet the 30 meter requirement. And is this the site inspection? A site inspection for the only place to put the septic system? Yes, it has. We have Pat next. Where is the property system going? I'm trying to understand. trying to understand where this is going. Is it just stop, does it go over here? Is, it, is all of this below the high water mark, the whole area? Um, I don't believe the whole, walk, whole area is. I believe it, it heads back generally in that sort of fashion. Well, I guess the question is, if this were all higher here, why couldn't you go back over here? I mean, that's what we had on the field situation, if you remember, a couple of years ago. So that's what I found, you know, what is, this would suggest that the whole thing is below the high water mark, which I don't believe it is. I have been on this property, but it was probably 1974, and I do know that that was existing. My other question is, when was this built, and was this built with a permit? The boathouse was built in 2007, and it was with a permit. With a permit, okay, fair. Or it was built as a boathouse at that point. It was as a dry boathouse. Okay, fair enough. So right now it's a boathouse. Well, no, it's been changed this summer to a boathouse. But did you get? Yes, well, through the process. Okay, fair enough. My, my concern is that really this issue. What? Where does this go? Because maybe we can go back and hear something. Yeah. Councillor Cooper. Um, yeah, I, I, I was kind of perplexed when I saw this as well, so very similar comments to uh, Councillor Edwards and is that I, I find the survey is a little bit uh, misleading or, or insufficient, I guess, lacking some information. So I would, uh, I would find it helpful if um, we could get the surveyor to, to tell us where that, what that back area really is. It, and, and I looked at the, 
the pictures actually that showed the, the walkway that went across to the what is now a cabin or going to be sorry going to be a cabin um, and it looked like a little stream to me almost uh, you know uh, sort of low-lying land with a, with a very very tiny stream going through there so clearly I guess in very high water although we're getting close to that now um, clearly in very high water water somehow gets in there from from the, sh the shores of the bay and back into a back lot area but effectively we've almost got an island at the front here is in, in, in a sense it's a it's a complete split down the middle of the of the lot and uh, so when I looked at it I wondered is there a way to put that septic system even further back um, and and make it even more compliant shall we say and then and I guess with the old planning adage which is that if it can if, if it can comply it should comply and uh, so so that's a, a concern of mine um, I, I guess uh, you know the other option is with with a situation like this in terms of closeness to the high water mark is um, and we just went through this uh, uh, previously but I, I have a feeling that uh, another way of dealing with this is a holding tank so um, you know, and some people feel they're not ideal and, and uh, um, expensive to pump out, but on the other hand, uh, they are uh, generally very secure. And, and I do worry about uh, not having a very large mantle here. Uh, it, it seems to be fine to the front, but to the rear, um, you know, the setback isn't, isn't terrific and the mantle uh, is, is pretty marginal to say the least. So. Uh, from a safety perspective, water safety perspective, that's my concern. Uh, Councillor Kay. Um, looking at the picture, figure three, that says proposed septic location, is there any concerns at all with it being uh, that close to hydro lines and the 35 foot right away and that type of thing with hydro? I addressed uh, with the hydro one. Uh, I actually worked with hydro one. <laughs> contacted the senior uh, technician in the Hemetang machine and discussed that they have no concerns. I had the emails from staying that they're not concerned about it. The uh, pole that's existing there is a 35 foot pole and a pole down, so it's pole 35 feet high. The secondary triplex coming across to my neighbor, and the fill around that pole will be less than, well, the highest point of the Old lady's bed would be six feet. So, very funny for us. We had no concerns. Very nice. And on that high water mark on the left or west side of the property, they went past the existing cottage and wanted to know, the surgeon wanted to know if he wanted me to go any further. And as we're looking for a septic on the east side of the property, I said, no, you don't need to go any further because that's the line that we need to have to see what distance we can get. So uh, that's why we don't show the whole area because you wouldn't want to go across the 177.4 to another location. Councillor Bocek. My question is to Jamie or to Dave, or let's see Dave is here. With the additions uh, to the bunky to, to convert it into the cottage, uh, the existing septic bed is not sufficient and it's going to have to be expanded. Am I correct? So the, the positioning of the septic bed right now is obviously approved uh, for, the, for the dwelling. Is there room where it's situated right now to do the expansion? Or do we have? Does that have to be relocated? Do you worship? No, there's no, there's no room where it's existing right now to expand it to accommodate the proposed use. And the existing location is, I'd suggest, is more non-compliant than the, the location where the new system is being proposed. So. Okay. Well, I don't have any issues at all with the uh, with the development of, of, of the bunky becoming a. The living quarters of the main dwelling. It, I call that sensible development. You're not, you're not. Um, the, the view from the canoe is not going to change hardly at all. Um, 
I don't have really any issues with the swapping of the two buildings. My only concern would be that the septic bed is suitable and that our building department works within that envelope to make sure that it's done properly. But, uh, I don't see any issue. I think it's, it's been done quite right. And I know there was one, only one uh, letter of disapproval from uh, a citizen, Kathy Cooper, um, but it made mention of it doesn't meet the four tests. Well, I think the four tests are basically to do with the minor variance, not so much to do with planning. Am I correct in, in assuming that as well, too? That, a, that an amendment uh, to a, a zoning amendment doesn't really have the same test that a minor variance would have. For you, Your Worship, um, in terms of the test for the four tests that are being referred to, those are apply to minor variance and not apply to a rezoning application or a special plan amendment, which is what this is. Um, tests are really similar, though, from the perspective of the test for, for an official plan amendment is only by law amendment or really over the official plan conformity and, and good planning at the end of the day, and that's really what those other sort of two or three tests are trying to achieve. One of those you don't the tests you don't have to meet here is the intent of the bylaw because we're changing now, what do you need to meet? Does it meet the OP? Sure, Su supplement to that. We didn't, we had mentioned that the Cognition Cottage Association had done a site visit or sent representatives to the, the property and had looked at it. Um, have we received any correspondence from the uh, Cottage Association? Not according to the script I was provided. Okay, so it was kind of left open ended and I just, uh, through, the, through the resident, said that. The Cognition Cottage Association did attend the property, but he didn't give us what their response was when they were when they were there. That would be fairly important to me. And if I could ask Mr. Mayor that we hear from the resident on that. Yeah, uh, what you've stated is actually hearsay at the table here. We don't have a letter from them. We did have uh, this representative, Bill, who came out and I went through the whole thing with him. He said he would support it. I contacted the township and said, that you received a letter from Bill's area? And they said, no, we normally get that sent when we send out the uh, notice of the meeting and our application. So the fact that you don't have it is a surprise to me because Bill Sayer and his wife were both out and he said he had no objection and he would support it. Okay. I do have it for me. I don't know if I have an email or not. I have it for That's okay. That's fine. Well, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Douglas. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that, uh, you know, I, I thank the applicants for their uh, due diligence on um, doing their homework ahead of time and, and working with the township to try and meet all the criteria. I think you've done a great job, and I personally have no problem supporting this. Um, knowing that our staff will do their due diligence to make sure that everything is put in the right perspective of the septic area. Thank you. Councillor Rianco. I just want to clarify something, uh, Jamie. On, on the diagram here. This system is tied into this system? Yes. But we're going to talk about the outhouse. Uh, is that an outhouse? It's an outhouse. So what's this? That's the septic. That's the bed. For what? The other house hasn't been used uh, since we've owned the property. Yeah, but it says septic. Uh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so well, so Paul's got the floor here. Yeah. Yeah, it says a pump chamber, is that from the outhouse to here? Yes. Okay, so this is actually, okay, this is going to, well, I think you can still use it. So this is being mothballed? Taken out of service? Okay, you said no. No. Is it just going to, sorry, it's just a, it's going to stay with this cottage and this is a separate one for this one? That's correct. Okay. Oh, so this has already been approved. The yes. But there's some tension to close it. Okay, so it's going to be two septic systems on this, on this property. So, Jamie, is that allowed? Yep. There's only? Okay. Sure. Thanks for the answer. Uh, Councillor uh, Edwards. Uh, but then, the, the, what is now the existing cottage on the left-hand side, um, cooking facilities will be taken out of that, of course. Okay. 
The only question I'm really left with is where that line, that dotted line goes, because, uh, and I really, I've never come across a place having two septic systems. I really wonder whether, whether we're really doing the right thing or whether that's allowed under the building code. I want to go to Dave on that one. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I've never run into that, but I would like to find out where that line goes, because if we can move that further back, we can, and we have in other situations gone over low areas in between at this council. So, and, and just just so I'm understanding things, the actual conversion of this to a this the sleeping cabin to a cottage, even though the applicant had talked to us, we're doing that today by approving this bylaw. Is that correct? This is going to be a recommendation yeah. to come back to council. Well, so. but, it, but, but he hasn't had prior approval. To, we are the approval body on this, right? With regard to converting the sleeping cabin to a cottage. That's what the application is for? That's correct. Okay, so that, I was just confused by the comment that he'd already had it approved by planning staff. Through you, Worship. Um, what's being proposed through the, from, so what council has approval authority over is the zoning bylaw amendment. Right. You would adopt the official plan amendment and then it goes to the district for approval. <coughs> so they're the approval authority on the official plan amendment. You're the approval authority on the zoning amendments. Mm -hmm. The CEO is the approval authority on the building permit yeah, application. Okay. So but the conversion, mm -hmm. he's got he's got to sign off on the conversion that it needs to help. So there's three different <laughs> approvals. Yeah. Just uh, received a letter from Cognachine. No, I just received a letter from staff. For, uh, that is a letter from Cognachine. Um, they did send it when before the deadline, so uh, it was stating that they have no, um, or sorry, states that they support the application mm. and they appreciate the opportunity to comment. So I can cross that one off my list. Okay, you were done? Yeah. Okay, Councilor Cooper. Well, I'm pleased to hear that there is a response from, from the CCA, and uh, I didn't certainly doubt your, your uh, comments that you dealt with them, but uh, it, would have been, it would have been problematic not having some sort of uh, response from them, in my mind. But um, I guess there's just a few sort of outstanding issues for me, and that is the survey concerns me. Uh, the two septic systems, I'm really kind of uncomfortable with that subject and, and I'd like to um, have a report from staff on that. I, I, I really am concerned that uh, why are we doing that? How can we not handle this? Uh, effectively what we're really doing by having two septic systems there are, are, is having two main dwellings in a sense on, on this property. So uh, even if you're calling it a sleeping cabin on one side and now a cottage on the other, that, that concerns me a little bit. So. You, there's a, so a few pieces that are sort of sitting out there for me. I, I think in, in total, I'd probably over time support this, but I, I'm lacking some information at the moment. That's where I feel I'm at. Okay, well, I believe those comments will go back to planning and they'll uh, put a report together for next month. Okay. So the gist I'm getting is we need to know where that second line is, is going, does it travel further back or, or what, um, and have a, a second look at the location of the septic as to whether it could go up where it says the word bone, uh, way up at the top at this point, um, and uh, well, the, the two septic systems. But, uh, since it's coming from an outhouse, it's, there's no bathroom uh, planned for the the uh, proposed bunkie. Used to be a cottage. Is, it, yeah, is that coming out? And yeah, the yeah, kitchen's yeah. coming out. Through your work, your worship, the sleeping the, the existing <coughs> cottage has a bathroom and a kitchen in it right now. The kitchen will be coming in. The bathroom would stay. It would use that existing septic system. The new septic system would be for the uh, for the sleeping cabin is being converted to the dwelling. Mm -hmm. So can we leave it with you and Dave 
as to whether the uh, old septic system should come out or if it uh, can stay there. We just tie the one in. Yeah, I can. And you can leave that with, with us. I can assure you that we have looked at the set that old septic systems. And the fact is that because of the size restriction, because of the size of the site, if we were to put, put one septic system here that was for both units, we don't have enough, there's not enough area in that location. That's why this solution has been developed and why the existing system would stay. I would, the existing, there would be a lot less pressure on the existing system because it's only being used as a sleeping cabin periodically, but as Mr. Brand, Brand uh, mentioned. So the, the main cottage, which is now the sleeping cabin, will uh, will use the new upgraded septic system with the new system. So you can put all that in your report? Yeah. Because a month from now, we may not remember this conversation. So. Yeah, so I have all of those notes taken down and the, the comments from all the council and we'll make sure those are addressed in the staff report. Councilor Edwards? Just a comment that any other situation, in fact, the one we did a sleeping cabin 10 years ago, and we put in a brand new septic system, but it all runs to the one. There's a pump chamber underneath the sleeping cabin it pumps up and goes into the new system which serves the cottage. So I just wonder whether we're starting a precedent around this issue of two septics and indeed we'll find that out. We'll, we'll research that in the staff report, but I'm certainly multiple properties in the municipality that have more than one septic system. Okay, so I have a resolution here moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Bocek be resolved that council direct staff to consider the comments received for OPA 17-03 and zoning bylaw 17-21 for 6980 Island 1810 and prepare a recommendation report and bylaw that will be brought back to a subsequent council meeting for consideration. Any last comments? No? So we'll call the question, all those in favor? And that carries. So next month, and keep your phone ready in case uh, Jamie has to give you a call and ask we questions. Have email addresses. <laughs> Sorry? We have each other's email addresses. Okay, that's better. Phone's sometimes better. Okay, so that okay, closes so our uh, public meetings for the day. Uh, public meetings for the day. All the recess and I'm going to call the recess. And I was ordered to two ordered to two chow down time. Chow down time.
what's your guesstimate on the time? Uh, 12.30 this afternoon was my guesstimate. <laughs> I think everything's pretty straightforward. So beside, beside this, Rosemary. This side of Rosemary. Yeah. I never knew her name. She never knows, you know, we talk all the time. Have you been up to the site on Woods Falls Road, Paul? No, God, no. <coughs> I don't want to. Well, I've seen pictures. It's a disaster. Yeah. No, so I what know. are they doing there? Are they replacing, a replacing a culvert. Who's building it? And uh, to, to, to the culvert that was in there collapsed. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's a big culvert. It's a walk-through culvert. Oh, yeah. 
And so the project was to take it out and replace it with a cement yeah. culvert. Five weeks. I've been going up there steady for the last four so weeks. What's one the or two people were just digging a hole or getting the crane or just dogging it. There's nobody, nobody working there. Either. I heard somebody say there were only one or two guys there. So. I was there Thursday. There was one guy sitting underneath the overhang smoking a cigarette without even a hard on it. So who's doing it? Is that Donald? Mm -hmm. They obviously double booked themselves and they had to you know, move off site. Paul, when we, when we did that up there at the district, remember there was a penalty or there was a, a, a reward for finishing early? Yeah. $7,000 a day for finishing early. Okay. That was the incentive so they'd get it done. Uh, obviously, that's going to the window, yeah. but was there a penalty put in place for every day that they're late? Yes. I think we should have yes. that reward for this council meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm finishing early. But that's why they changed the date. So now it's new date. Yeah, but yeah, that's all I'm concerned. The, the date was fixed, and from that date to December well, it's always, As you know, it's always discussed. And as long as, as, long as the district we go, then no. We should have put that diverted road in there. Well, that doesn't mean that that may not come in earlier. December the 5th or whatever, that's for the toll roads. You may get partly in the corner. Mm -hmm. But your friend up at the, up at the marina, he's probably told me this. He's living. Yeah. But he is plowing snow for him. Mm -hmm. Apparently he's getting on call 250 a day. From mm -hmm. the district mm -hmm. to plow snow. This construction? Or no? From his marina down to the construction. Okay. He left me a message. It was, it was, it was, he was very concerned. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. It's 146. It's 146. And the first item and the first the clerk's item. report deeming bylaw. The clerk's report straight deeming bylaw. Pretty, pretty straightforward. So I'll read straight the resolution. Forward. So I'll read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor K. Councilor K. Edwards, by Councillor K. Be resolved that Councillor K. Be resolved that Councillor passed bylaw 2017 deeming bylaw to deeming a deeming bylaw to deem Avenue 30 to be not Avenue A to be not on a plan of subdivision. Councillor, have any questions? Councillor, have any questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favour. I'll call the question. All those in favour. Okay. Carries. 
Sure. Jamie is the next one you the drift Jamie is the next one site plan amendment cove site plan amendment Cole's note version Cole's note version these folks have so these folks have a registered site plan agreement they're proposing a new building they're proposing a haven on the internet site plan that is the same agreement amendment that was shown on the screen here is the what's shown on the screen here is the location proposal where it is uh this is so Structure complies with the bylaw in all respects, um, but they do need council approval for an amendment to the site plan. So, any questions? I'd be happy to. We're recommending approval of the site plan. Okay, Councilor Bianco. What's it going to be used for? Just storage of boats. Uh, that's boats and equipment. So what they've identified. Is it big enough for boats? <clears throat> It's not very big. Well, it's not that big, but it's you like put a few things in it. It's a closet building, is what they're looking at. It's oh. Mm -hmm. Is this the only uh, building on the site right now? I'm looking at it. I can't really tell. Uh, I think there is. There's a real estate office there somewhere yeah, right in front of it. It's, it's not there anymore. Oh, it's gone? It's, it's gone for months. No. Really? I guess all I see is the transport trucks. Site. No, there's a building right there. The building right there. Yeah, there's a cottage there. there. Yeah, still there. That's the original Milne, Milne Cottage. What? That's Milne? the original <laughs> Milne Cottage. There was six yeah. cottages there. It's called Milne's Cottages. Oh, I see. And that's the Milne. one that's left. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Councilor Kay? I'm a little bit confused with this one. Is this the same one? Where we approved uh, for the 22. Yep. Okay, so why why is this in the name of Driftwood and the other two, the other ones in the name of Fundy Club? Are they one and the same? Do you worship? That's my understanding is that they're one and the same. Um, the application that was submitted. I guess Driftwood's the common name for it, but the application that was submitted was by the same it was by Punico, which is what he agrees with as well. So it's all one and the same. And, it, and this building that's being built is for the benefit of these 22 docks that they already built, I guess? It's, for the, it's being constructed by the owner, so I'm not sure exactly what he's proposing to store in the building, or if it's for the benefit of future people that might dock their boat there, or what. It's a storage building. It's okay. So resolution is moved by Councillor Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards. It resolved that the mayor and council authorize the mayor and clerk to execute bylaw 2017-2017 97 being an amendment to the site plan agreement for 66 Port Severn Road North to allow a 225 square meter storage building with a height of 5.4 meters. Any further questions? Call the question. All those in favor? And that carries. Next one is uh, Hope Bay. Park lot control. Certainly. So I'm not sure how familiar council is with park lot control applications or if you've dealt or remember dealing with any of these in the past in Oak Bay. Um, so what's being proposed to be developed at this time is the clubhouse is generally in this area here. So across from the, from the parking lot for the clubhouse is generally in this area here. What's 
being proposed are these existing blocks that are currently um, currently vacant in this area and right here are proposed for development at this time. So this is consistent with the development concept that's been outlaid for the uh, for the entire site. And what's being proposed is called release of part lock control. And what that is is what typically happens in urban areas is that if you're doing a townhouse development, you would uh, construct the foundations and then do what's called release of part lot control after that. <coughs> and that creates the different lots that are that you can then convey and sell. And usually that release of part lot control happens after the foundations are in because it guarantees you that the surveying is in exactly the right place, that those lot lines are, are in exactly the right place. So. What's being requested of council is to approve a release of part lock control application and then subsequently goes to the district for final approval. The, app, the Oak Bay has submitted, submitted building permit applications for, for the development in this area. So it has been reviewed for zoning compliance already. And um, so what they're proposing to construct does conform with it or does comply with the zoning bylaw. Um, so that's really a summary of, of the application for a lease of part lot control. So once, if council decides to approve it today, which is what we're recommending, it gets passed on to the district for final approval. Councilor Rianco? Um, I have no problem with <coughs> this development. However, I think we should add a condition to this approval. And that condition is that we open up the, the road uh, to the north here for the golf course. So that road is already constructed. Um, it's gravel right now. The entrance is all there. It's just a matter of uh, probably doing some little bit of work on it, maybe even widening it and opening up that road to the golf course. But right now, every everybody going to the golf course has to go down this, what's it called? Lynx? Lynx Trail. Lynx Trail. Everybody going to the golf course goes <coughs> down Lynx Trail. Now you're adding probably another 20, 30 homes in here. So now you probably are getting close to 50 places down here. Mm -hmm. That would uh, benefit directly from a new entrance to the golf course. And I was disappointed when I talked to uh, the manager a while ago that he had no plans in the near future to open up that road. Uh, to the golf course, and I think here's an opportunity for us to force them to do that to the benefit of these 50 or so locked in there already. Is, is this possible to put in this kind of condition? Through your worship, I would have to look into that. Um, I'm not aware immediately of the, the status or what, what agreements were made in the subdivision agreement with respect to this road and timing for opening of it. So we can, we can look into that. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I would Nick, have to do yeah. some research. I think Nick knows about it because he supplied me with some information. It, it, right now, the only the, when they have to open up that road, it's a condition of, of block four, and there's no plans to block four until several more years down the way, if ever. So I think it's it's best to open up this road sooner than wait to some indefinite time when block four is going to be built, and that's way down the road. I think it's almost down there by the 17th hole, I think it's block four. And I don't think there's any plans in the, in the next five or 10 years to even develop down there. So I think we have to force the issue of opening up that road and take the traffic off this Lynx Drive. And I'm looking for support from council to put that as a condition of this and see if you can look into it too. Councilor Cooper. Sorry, uh, Paul, I just don't understand. Are you talking about the road that's on the right-hand side here? Right now, the golf club is right about here. Okay. Up here is where they're supposed to come off of the um, Stoker Road, like right. five, come in and to the golf course. I see. And that's already been built. It's just sitting there. So yeah. where, does this, <laughs> where does this road go then? It goes all the way down to golf course. Well, I get that. And of course, back to the community center. But, but so they're close. When, once you get up to the Honey Harbor Road, I'll call it. They're they're fairly close together, are they? Uh, quarter, 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 quarter. Oh, that far apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's to the it's closer to the municipal office. Okay. It's the Willow Lanes Drive. The driveway that goes into Willow Lanes Trailer Park. Oh, over there. Okay. And then the second question I had, 
Jamie, uh, you may have said this, but I, I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't listening carefully enough, but what is the purpose, what's going in there? Uh, are they single family or townhouses or whatever? They're townhouses. It's consistent with the development concept that was pro approved through the subdivision process, but they're gonna look the same as the, as the units that are in there right now. Thank you. What I would suggest is if, rather than add a condition at this time, I would suggest if that's something you want us to look at, to see if it's something we can include, that uh, we defer it and bring it back for consideration at next month's meeting with some more information about the nature of that road and, and municipality and the subdivision agreement that's been entered into and that sort of thing. So if you talk to all these 50 people now, there's people talking about this, I imagine 100% with that, the, I, I think the deferral is the, the best route. Timing isn't immediately of the essence right now because they can't, um, it's upon occupying them that the part lock control has to be done. So they could start building in there any time because the proposed buildings would comply with the zoning bylaw. They can be issued permits. It's the release of part lock control that's being requested through this process. So you may see construction start in there in the interim. Councillor Bochek. Part of my, my question is the foundations are already in for these buildings. Um, and, and I was wondering, you know, when this had to be completed, what, what we're talking about today, and obviously if it's not pertinent, it's done before construction starts because construction has started. No. Understand that. And I am in concurrence with Councillor Bianco that, that um, there's a lot of construction going to be continuing to be done in there. This is this is only the next phase, and uh, the residents are pretty tired of 80 to 100 dump trucks a day going down that road, past their residents. Where if you come in from the the east end off of the Little Ends <coughs> Road, uh, you don't go by any not a single home. So it, it is something that I've heard that they, they would like to see happen. And I don't know why it's not open. You've traveled part of it in a golf cart. It's going. Yeah, I'm very familiar yeah. with it. So I guess maybe that's another question we can ask them: is if even the construction traffic for now could use the other entrance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's <coughs> got to be hundreds of people go by there every day for golf. Yeah. yeah. There'd have to be dust suppression, that sort of thing. But yeah, getting the uh, heavy equipment off a of Lynx Trail would be a good idea. Because this road has been talked about for as long as Oak Bay's been on the books here. So um, I know they bought uh, half of the road allowance towards the, the lake and the trailer park, bought the other half. Yeah. Um, so it's still in our ownership, but it's a district uh, sewage pumping building right on the corner there. And that's where the, uh, the road is supposed to come out. Somewhere's right in that neighborhood. So. So, so staff will take it back, we'll review the question of the road, we'll re review the timing of construction anticipated to make sure that if we do add that condition, you know, it's the winter season and everything coming oh, along. It's a decent, decent springtime. But I asked the question at the Segway uh, meet and greet at the Oak Bay and it wasn't on the horizon to yeah. open that road up. And yet, they were talking about other developments further down the road that we were not talking about for now. Yeah. So, end of discussion. We'll just defer this. And uh, will you be able to bring this back next month? If I get the information I need, then I will certainly bring it back next month. Okay. So the next item is uh, CP draft agreement operations. Brad, Cole's notes. Thank you, Your Worship. This is just a requirement of the agreement for the construction of the overpass map here. Uh, the purpose of the agreement is to lay out uh, who's responsible for what. So the township's responsible for the roads, and CP is responsible for the layout and maintaining the walls and overpass. 
Okay, Councillor Rangel. Uh, I have no problem with the road and so on, but I do have a problem with the uh, uh, storm sewer there with all that fancy uh, filtration system in there. I, I assume that's part of this deal. Through the mayor, as part of the agreement with the township, would take it over maintenance of it once uh, yeah. it was installed. So yeah. we do have extra filters that yep. have been provided by CP for 25 years, but yeah. it does require quarterly or uh, year maintenance. Okay, and is this part of the deal here? Uh, are we assuming the, that responsibility? Are we assuming that responsibility today by approving this? We are assuming that responsibility, and that was part of the agreement, right. the initial agreement. I agree it is, but I, I understand we were supposed to have several years of operating data from that storm drain, so we weren't getting ourselves into a problem. Do we have that information? We have two years of uh, monitoring and maintenance data from it. Okay. That shows that it's been working as well. Okay, and we got two trailer loads or two? We got a whole bunch. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, you're satisfied, because that's going to be the way the work is. Everything else is routine, but that's not routine. That's right. And you're happy with it. Okay. Okay, so the resolution's moved by Councillor Kay and uh, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that staff be directed to execute the maintenance agreement with CPR. So is it only staff? Thank you, Jamie. Only staff that has to sign it, or does the mayor have to sign it too? So do we need that in there? Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> somebody will complain. <coughs> Probably mayor and clerk. So it's been amended. It says, be it resolved that council direct the mayor and clerk to execute the maintenance agreement with CPR. Any further questions? Call the question, all those in favor? Carries, thank you. District roads rationalization. Um, I think your worship you may recall during the presentation last month from the district and CCT that we asked for a resolution from the council, but they were really saying what they wanted in the resolution and what they were looking for. So in response to that, we put together a draft resolution that basically says read the resolution, that sounds good. Uh, I'll, I'll read it first. Moved by uh, Councillor Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved that Council direct staff to advise the District of Muskoka that the Township will not be providing comments regarding the District's road rationalization study presentation from the October 12 Council meeting until a detailed financial analysis has been provided by the District and the proposed terms of the road downloading be provided to council for review. Questions, comments? Councillor Rianco? Well, my first question is why do we need this? <clears throat> because obviously we're not going to, council's not going to accept it without that information. I don't know if we need a resolution to do that, but I'm not going to uh, uh, vote against the resolution. But uh, I guess the question I have, what, what are other, um, towns and townships doing? Are they passing similar resolutions or are we doing this on our own without any uh, discussion with other? Through the mayor, I've spoken to, I believe three other uh, people in my position for other townships. They're, they have just received the presentation. We were the first ones to receive it. Um, and in response, I've been told they're going to provi be providing a similar resolution that without any financial information, there's not much they can say. Anything else? 
think of public works, we basically told them that too. So. Yeah, I don't know why we're getting yeah. a resolution to do that. Well, it sends a message that yeah. we're not going to do anything until they give us the finances. How much this is going to cost us or how much rebate we're going to get on our uh, district portion or um, how much of uh, the reserve funds we're going to get, all that sort of thing. So. Because <clears throat> every road is in a different uh, stage of, of uh, you know, whether it's going to be repaired next year or 10 years from now. So, so it's a very difficult position to, uh, <coughs> to assess. Well, I, I would hope that we would accept uh, 33 or 32 without them being upgraded, like we have with um, South Bay Road. Uh, that'll be part of the negotiations. I, well, yeah, I, I, I know I will be supporting taking all those other two roads unless they're upgraded by the district. I don't think we want our staff to have to look after upgrading those roads. Mm -hmm. Councillor Edwards? Is this an election issue by any chance, Bert? You can make it that if you wish. Mm -hmm. I, somehow I don't think uh, much of this is going to happen before uh, okay. nomination day. So. Okay, so no more questions. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carries. Next item is submitted by Councillor Bocek. I'll read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that Council direct staff to contact both MPP Norm Miller and Tony Clement with a letter recommending a review on float planes on small cottage lakes and the danger and disturbance they create in the township of Georgian Bay. Brian? Yeah, this came uh, out of last month's count meeting I received a, a, a few constituents calling me about these float planes and narrow bodies of water where on Go Home Bay there's a lot of canoe, kayak traffic and that. And Transport Canada and Federal Aviation take care of things when the plane is in the air. And when the plane touches to the ground it becomes a boat. And then it's governed by all the, the bodies that, that take care of boards and things like that. Their concern is that these planes uh, continually take off and land in a very narrow body of water and, and it, it's not only annoying but it's dangerous when they could taxi out to a bigger body, body of water and, and take off from a bigger body of water. So uh, really the reason for, for asking and sending the letters away to the, to the feds and, and the provincial government was to get more information and that's pretty much all it's for information. To see if we can do anything. Township at this point in time can do nothing about the floor plans. Unless they're making too big waves and they're going too fast in a bore. Yeah, but they don't take off in a bore. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Cooper? Just point of clarification uh, what are we going to do about the lakes that have large cottages? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, so, so I was just going to suggest that we might want to twist the words and just say in small lakes. The seasonal residences? That, that, that could very well be done, I'm sure, just through some changing of the wording in the letter. In the letter itself. To do that. The, um, I, as a counselor, I work very much like a lot of our yeah. departments here, and I'm a complaint-driven counselor, and I haven't heard any complaints from the bigger bodies of water. <laughs> These planes, so I'm acting on the small bodies of water. I was just <clears throat> having some fun. I but, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, my only uh, comment is that uh, even in large bodies of water like Georgian Bay, a lot of people are landing in very narrow areas like the Freddie, you know, the Freddie Channel. They land in, the, in that channel, and uh, maybe they they uh, go out to the main channel to take off, but it's not very wide. So, so the problem exists in a number of different places, and uh, I think it would be good to get some clarification from Transport Canada. I have actually reported certain pilots. Uh, um, particularly the, uh, um, what do they call them, the ultralights that, that come buzzing up by my place. It's sort of like the ride of the Valkyries and 
and they come out in tens and twelves of them and then do touch and goes and their kids swimming in the area so it's very dangerous mm -hmm. so I, I, I really uh, think your point is uh, well taken I do encourage to see if we can get some sort of support on that so you wanted to just say lakes small lakes yeah small lakes or just lakes small bodies of water small bodies, small bodies of water within the township well, we can leave it as lakes. Yeah. <coughs> I don't think they're going to be landing on a pond. So. Yeah, well, it's the Great Lakes. But back to Peter's comment about the Great Channel. I mean, that that's in the same category. So why would we say small water bodies, lakes, and other small water bodies above that? Yeah, I don't. I kept it kind of broad because I don't know the definition at the federal level or the provincial level of what they class a small body of water. I don't know the terminology or the definitions that they use. Uh, so I just kept it broad, broad spectrum and directed mainly towards the complaints. But I agree that we should change the wording to something a little more expensive. No, because you want them to take off in the big Well, one. narrow water bodies would cover... Huh? We just take the word small and <laughs> cottage and just say lakes. Georgia Bay Lake. Mm -hmm. It's the sixth great lake, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Oh. Uh, <coughs> again, this, is the only, <laughs> this issue's only been brought up at Little Go Home Bay, um, and where there's probably about a half a dozen seaplanes down there, and it just happened to be all down to one end. Correct. And for them to actually uh, mow out to the big lake, it's going to take about a half. No, it shouldn't be that long. But it'll take them 10, 15 minutes to mow all the way up, which in itself is noisy. So I don't know if that's, that's even feasible. Um, is there a, 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 an action for ourselves maybe to send out a bylaw enforcement officer and and have a discussion with these people indicating that there is concerns up and down Little Go Home Bay about the frequencies of landings and takeoffs, just so they know that there is an issue in that bay. Um, is there an appetite to direct our uh, bylaw enforcement officer to talk to these people, a friendly discussion saying, hey, there is concerns in the bay, Don't take it into consideration? Is that a, a role that we could fill? I don't think bylaw has any jurisdiction over the They don't have plans. jurisdiction, but at least okay. tell them that there's, there's a noise of concern, a yeah. safety concern, and at least these, these pilots will then know that there are people along their shores who are concerned about it. They may not even know it's an issue right now. I imagine they do know now because I talked to uh, one of the pilots and let him know what was coming, so they've probably spread the word amongst themselves and they can watch our agenda. So that's the concern of the, the resident who sent me this letter was, we do not have a bylaw on the books, hence we can't send a bylaw officer to enforce any bylaws. And um, the pilots are simply going to say, I'm governed by the federal aviation governing body. Okay. That's, why, so that's why we've gone beyond that and gone to the steps to take it to the, the feds and the province. Yeah, let's leave it up to them. Yeah. Well, why wouldn't you at least make these people aware that we have sent on letters. Because otherwise, you know, I, I, I disagree with Paul. I wouldn't be sending out bylaw people. It takes too much time and effort. But if we know who, where these people are, you know, what's going to be, send them a letter. And just, you know, send them we've sent this letter because there have been concerns expressed. I agree with that one too. <clears throat> I'll let my one pilot know. He'll spread the word real quick. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so I've taken the word small cottage out and we've just left lakes. It's okay? So I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carries. And the last item. I put on, and it's uh, Mayor Scott Warnick's just asking us to support his letters on page 137 in the agenda. 
The resolutions moved by Councillor Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be resolved that the Township of Georgian Bay supports the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit's letter to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care regarding a smoke-free Ontario. Any questions? Comments? Good. Call the question. All those in favour? Carries. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards. We have resolved that Council adopts bylaw 2017-99 being a bylaw confirming the proceedings of the November 13 Council meeting. 17 we Council meeting. Questions, comments? Questions, comments? All the question, all those in favor? All the question, all those in favor? Carries. And finally, and finally, I need a mover. Councillor Kay? I need a mover. Councillor Kay? By Councillor Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Kay, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Council does now adjourn. Council does now adjourn. Council does now adjourn. Two nineteen p.m. until Monday, December eleventh, Monday, December eleventh, at nine a.m. Two thousand seventeen at nine a.m. The chair. Or at the call. All those in favour. Chair. All those in favour. Carries. Turned out one of the lead pilots. 